Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this talk, Keep Your Cash Always Fresh with Divisium. I hope you can still hold up for one more talk, then another talk after that. I know it's a long week. Um, whenever I've been to DevOx, I always felt like super exhausted on Friday. So I hope you still have a little bit of energy for staying through this one with me. All right, so what will I hopefully t um, tell you about in the next 50 minutes? So assume you work on this kind of application. Let's assume it's an e-commerce application. And so far, this looks pretty much standard. So you have a Postgres database, which stores all your data, all your purchase orders, all your um, inventory items, and so on. And you have an application instance um, next to it, right? So in this case, this is, just for the sake of the example, it's built using Quarkus, but it could be built using Spring Boot. It could be, it could be a microservice, uh, sorry, a monolith, whatever. But so we have this kind of classical architecture. Now, to make it a bit more interesting, let's assume we have multiple instances of this application. So let's assume we have one in New York City, we have another one in London. The reason for doing this is, well, maybe there is a few requests in this application which we actually can serve just locally from those application instances. So we don't need to go to this database. And of course, having um, application instances close by to our users is beneficial just in terms of network latency and so on. Furthermore, let's assume there's another component, which is this legacy order entry system. So as you know, we always would like to be on the green field. We would like to start with new stuff, new shiny technologies. Um, but that's not the reality, right? Usually there is this old legacy stuff around. And well, I shouldn't say legacy, probably it's the, the stuff which creates our current revenue, which keeps us alive. Um, so we have to deal with the reality. And now in this example, let's assume it's another application. Maybe it's some, some sort of host application even, or maybe some old monolithic application, which directly writes to this database. So it doesn't use any APIs in this new uh, microservice architecture, but it directly writes to the database. And we will see what kinds of implications this has. Now. This is the scenario we're in. So we have this canonical system of record, our Postgres database. We have deployments of this architecture in different geographies. And let's assume, I would say this is pretty common, we have a large uh, share of read requests. So you know, let's say we have 90% of our requests are reads, and only a small share of our requests actually is writes. But in terms of those reads, we actually want to do some sorts of context, uh, complex queries. So maybe some sort of many-way joins, perhaps in order to materialize an entire um, purchase order, we need to join an order headers table with an order lines table, maybe with some shipment address table, and so on. So those queries you know, can be complex. And um, this is actually what maybe we hear some complaints. So you know, the business side of the house maybe reach out, reaches out to us and they say, so we like this application you guys built over in IT, but sometimes we feel there is a bit of a slowness there. So some of the views are loading a bit slowly. Can you do something about it? So that's the situation we are, we are in and which we would like to address. Which brings us to our mission, so shared system of record database, because, well, we want to have one database, you know, which is the, the, the source of truth. Um, but we then would like to have those denormalized and localized views um, close to our users. Why do I say denormalized? Well, maybe we can pre-compute such a join. So and then if we actually go to our local version of the data, instead of having to compute the join on the fly, we just could do maybe a key lookup or some sort of efficient index lookup. So we would like to do this sort of denormalized views. And you may have heard about this also as a command query responsibility segregation architecture, CQRS. And of course, we need to reason about how to keep everything in sync, right? So our system of record with those local views, we need to reason about how we can keep those things in sync. Cool. So um, I. I'm Gunnar Molling. I work as a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I'm mostly involved with Debezium, which is a project for change data capture, and I will get to what this is in a bit. Um, I'm involved with a few other things. I've contributed a little bit to Quarkus. I've uh, built a command line tool for Kafka Connect, which is called KC Cuddle. I did a demo about this yesterday, so if you have missed that, you can watch the recording on the DevOps YouTube channel. All right, so let's get back to our problem statement, let's say. So this is the situation where we're at. And well, the obvious thing to do is if we have this sort of slow read situation, well, we will add caches to our application architecture, right? So this is what we want to do. We add caches in those different geographies. So we would have a cache of our data in the New York City data center. We would have another cache in London, so in each of our geographies. So we can serve reads from those local caches. Um, but still, we will do all the writes to this canonical Postgres database in the middle. So to motivate this a little bit more, why 
would I think this is an interesting architecture? I would say, well, there's two reasons. So the first of all, well, there's the issue of network latency. And just recently, when I was preparing this talk, I came across this blog post, which is really um, read-worthy, and they kind of argue for the same kind of architecture, by the way. And they just gathered a little bit the network latencies you would have between different data centers. And this is from a Heroku application. By the way, this is not to talk badly about Heroku, it's just an example which they chose. So, you know, and this is an application which is deployed in a, in a data center in Virginia, and then they analyzed, okay, so how much time does it take to receive the first byte of any responses in different um, localities of the world, right? And you see those numbers there. Obviously, the further away you are, the longer it will take, and you start to sense this quite quickly. So if you are doing this request from Europe to the data center in the US, you will have like 300 milliseconds maybe, and the further you get away, the longer it will take. So if you're in Tokyo or Singapore, you might even approach one second. And I guess you're all aware of those uh, blog posts and numbers where, for instance, Amazon shares, you know, any additional 100 milliseconds of their requests or their page loads, it costs them this amount or that amount of revenue. So definitely having this sort of latency, is, it's not a good thing. So that's the first aspect. Having caches close by, it allows us just to optimize in terms of request latency. And secondly, as I already was mentioning, well, we can denormalize our data and then we just will be able to serve any requests more efficiently because it will be key or index excesses. All right. So... That makes sense, adding caches to the picture. And of course now the big question is, well, there's a big unknown part still in this architecture, right? So how do we keep those two things in sync? And this is of course what we need to reason about. Before, do, before going there, let me elaborate a little bit on the cache side of, of this solution. And now, there's many ca caches out there. I'm sure you've heard of uh, Redis, Hazelcast, all of all those kind of things. The one I'm talking a little bit about here is InfiniSpan, just for the say or for the reason that's the one I'm most familiar with. And well, it's also a Reddit-sponsored project, I should say that. Um, but really, it doesn't matter too much, right? It is just one particular implementation choice. This kind of architecture could be implemented with any kind of cache solution, I would say. There's a few things which make InfiniSpan particularly interesting for this kind of architecture. Um, and now, there could be an entire own talk about InfiniSpan. I just would mention a few key things, I would say. First of all, it's pretty flexible, pretty versatile in terms of how you use it. So, for instance, you can embed it in your application, which means you just make in-memory um, requests or access to your data, which of course, it's very efficient. You could also deploy it as a sort of a remote cluster. You could use it with Java, .NET, um, Node.js, all those kinds of things. So you have quite a bit of flexibility in terms of how you use this cache. Then it is pretty fault tolerant. So as we will see in a bit, uh, I can replicate my data. I can have it on multiple nodes within one cluster. I could even have multiple clusters of my data depending on my availability. Uh, and resiliency requirements. So I can, you know, get, get to quite a good state of fault tolerance. And what I also find particularly interesting about it is it's a curable cache. So most caches typically will just allow you to do key lookups. So you need to know what's the ID of my purchase order, or maybe you, you, have, you use something more meaningful as a key, or maybe an email address for users, but it is a key lookup. You cannot do any queries on secondary attributes for, sake, for, um, for the sake of the example. Whereas here, we actually have a query language and we can query our cache a little bit like a database. So that makes it quite interesting if you think about the scenario we are after. In terms of how I could use InfiniSpan, well, there's different modes and different ways for doing it. One uh, I just want to mention is I could use it as an embedded cache. Now, typically, my application will be uh, clustered, right? So let's assume within each of those geographies, we would have an application cluster of, let's say, three nodes, and our data will be shared amongst those nodes. And we can tune a little bit how much or what's the level of redundancy we would like to have. So we, in this case, we say, well, each of our data items should be on two nodes, which means, well, we can tolerate losing one node and we still will be able to serve our business purposes. And, well, if I add another item to this cache, um, well, by means of consistent hashing, it will be put to, all, to as many nodes as, as we have configured. So in this case, this, no, uh, this key four will, will go, uh, go to application instance one and two. And also, if I do a lookup, which I think is pretty interesting, well, I can go actually to any node in this cache cluster and it will retrieve the data. So if it, either if it's local on this node available, well, we, we will get it from there. Or if, it not, if, if it's not available locally, well, then InfiniSpin will automatically get the data from the other cache node which has it. If you compare this maybe to state stores and Kafka streams, if you have been using that, then you will know you need to implement this kind of 
re uh, routing your requests yourself. Here you will get this for free. Cool. So that's em embedded. Uh, so this all works in process, and which which is nice on the one hand because well you know we have the data in our own process, so we don't need to do any sorts of remote um, uh, requests to get our data. But it also poses a kind of a problem because, well, it makes our applications stateful. Now, why is this a problem? Well, we would like to be flexible, for instance, in terms of how we scale up or scale down the number of application instances. So let's say there is a period of increased load. Maybe the holiday season has arrived, so we will have more, well, hopefully anyways, more customers come into our site. We would like to spin up more nodes of our application. If this application is stateful, well, we need to think about redistributing this data, right? So it, it poses a bit of a problem. What should we do there? Or maybe we would like to update our application. Um, you know, we would like to do a rolling up, up, update to a new version. And well, again, we, will, we might start to redistribute the data which this one node had to other nodes which are still available or which are still online. And then suddenly this one node comes back because the update has completed. So having statefulness there in this application is a bit um, bad, I would say. So in a, in a sense, we would like to have state and stateful applications because we would like to have this cache state, but we also want them to be stateless, which, you know, is not, it's, it's a bit of a conflict. And um, again, InfinSpin helps us there because it also supports what's called a, a distributor or a client server mode. So in this case, my data isn't stored in process of my application instances themselves, but it is stored in a separate um, cache cluster. So it's in a separate cluster of cache nodes. Well, now, of course, I need to pay the price for doing remote access to this data. But I'm more flexible in terms of these scaling requirements, right? Uh, because my actual application itself, it's stateless, so that's good. And I would argue, well, yes, it is remote access to those cache nodes, but for instance, we could uh, still keep such a cache cluster close to our application cluster, right? So perhaps in, ter in terms of Kubernetes, we could have a cache cluster um, on our same Kubernetes instance as our application nodes, and we might even have a cache node on each worker node in the Kubernetes cluster. So we would have a very good locality. And also, by the way, what we can do is there's one feature in, in FinSpan which allows us, which is called near caching. And this actually means we still can use this kind of architecture with a remote cache and still have in-memory read-through caches uh, of the data, which means most of the times we would still get um, you know, data from our local in-memory caches, but those would be volatile. And then if you lose this state, we would have to go back to this cluster. So you can kind of have this cake and also eat it. The last thing I want to mention about InfinitySpan is um, it also supports a notion of cross-site replication. So what we can do is we can actually have multiple clusters of InfinitySpan in different locations and they will automatically re replicate the state. So in our example, we could have one cache cluster with three nodes over in New York City, another cache cluster in London, and InfinitySpan would take care to automatically keep those two clusters in sync. If we would lose one, well, we would have, you know, we could still go to the other one and so from there it would maybe take a bit longer, but we wouldn't lose any data. And then if the first cluster comes back up, all the state would automatically prob be propagated back and we would be able to go to this local cache cluster. So that's cross-site replication. All right. So um, I hope I could make the case having a cache like InfiniSpan, Redis, Hazelcast, whatever, um, makes sense to have in this architecture. Um, now, still, this question is open. How do we actually keep those caches in sync? How do we update them? Because, well, if we do writes to our database, we need also to update the view of our data in the caches, because otherwise we would serve wrong or just incomplete data, right? Now, um, well, if you have been at previous talks from me about Debezium, I always like to rant about what's called dual writes. So dual writes, that means you try to update multiple resources such as a database and Kafka, or a database and a uh, cache, for instance, um, at the same time, but then those two things are not sharing transactional boundaries. So if you look at something like Kafka, well, you cannot have a, an XA transaction which spans a database and Kafka, which means, well, you could try to update your database and you could send a message to Kafka, but it would be a sort of a best effort thing because it would just not be sure whether those two actions actually are applied. So what could happen is one gets applied and the other one fails, which obviously means your overall state 
across those resources is inconsistent, so that's not desirable. Now here, in the case of InfinSpin, I actually could do this kind of dual write because it can participate in XA transactions, but I still would argue it's not a good idea. First of all, um, well, maybe my particular cache just doesn't support it, so I would be back to square one, but even if it is supported, well, there is a sort of an availability concern, right? So maybe um, I want to update this cache and I would be happy just for a while to, you know, serve all my data straight from the database, but if I want to do this distributed transaction to those two resources, well, then I couldn't do that if my cache wasn't available. So that's a problem. And lastly, there's this legacy order entry component. So if I wanted to do this kind of dual write, so from my application to write data to the database and also update the state in the cache, I would need to do this in all the places where I do writes. Now, this means I would have to update this legacy order entry system. Or maybe I'm doing some sort of emergency data patch just on the database itself um, using a SQL interface, and then I also would have to remind myself to update the data in the cache. So all in all, I would not advise to do this kind of dual write. Well, what's the solution instead? The solution I would propose is what's called change data capture. And change data capture, this is um, well implemented by Debezium, which is an open source project for doing that. And this is what I would like to talk about for a few minutes. So by the way, who has heard about Debezium? Okay, uh, this is like um, three quarters. Who is using Debezium in production? Okay, that's a few brave ones of you. Very good, excellent. Um, so then let me explain it just a little bit. In general, what it means is it, is tapping into the transaction log of your database to extract change events. So all the databases, they have what's called the transaction log, um, which is used by the database as an append-only log for you know, uh, keeping track of all the data changes. And it will use the transaction log typically either, well, for two purposes generally, for transaction recovery in case uh, things go wrong, or for replicating your data to other instances in a cluster database setup. Now, if we go to the database transaction log, well, we can actually extract all the changes from there and um, react to those change events. So all the inserts, updates, deletes, they will be appended to the database, and we can, um, well, capture it from there and propagate those events to consumers. If you think about it, uh, if you, for instance, would try to find out whether a record has been deleted, you really cannot do this by going to the actual table itself because you would just not find it any longer. Um, so you wouldn't know which records have been deleted unless you were to think about something like soft deletes. Whereas here, in this case, uh, deletes are just appended to this transaction log. So for instance, we also can capture deletes. So that's what Debezium does in a nutshell. And typically, people use it with Apache Kafka for just having some sort of loose coupling between this event producer, which would be database and Debezium, and any kinds of event consumers. Most of the times people use it with Kafka Connect, um, which is a part of the Apache Kafka project, which is a development framework and runtime for these kinds of connectors. So you would use Apache Kafka as the, actually stream, as the actual streaming platform. You would use Kafka Connect as the runtime for your Debezium connectors, which take the data into Kafka, and then for any kinds of sync connectors for taking your data from Kafka to a search index, to another database, to a cache, or whatever. About Debezium itself, well, as I mentioned, it's all open source. It's a fully capable CDC, um, CDC platform. There is quite a few things which are not that much known. So, that, for instance, there's a UI. There is a support for what's called the outbox pattern, which is a particular design pattern for implementing data exchanges between microservices. All kinds of things. I don't want to talk about it too much. What I'm particularly proud of is there's a very active, a very healthy community around it. So up to this date, I believe like 350 people have um, contributed. So that's, that's quite a bit, I would say. And there's really large production environments. So I know people sometimes use it with hundreds or even thousands of databases in production. Um, so I would say that's been a pretty well proven. Now, to elaborate a little bit more on the use cases, why would you want to use CDC? Well, um, I would say most of the times people use CDC change their capture for replicating data from one database to another. Um, it could be another, another vendor's database. So maybe you want to replicate data from your production Oracle database over to a Postgres database just for, you know, um, analysis purposes. But also you could use those change events and, for instance, update an OLAP system. So maybe you do have something like Apache Pino or Druid or ClickHouse, uh, which you would like to feed with your operational data from your relational database system. Well, you could use those change events for setting up such a 
data pipeline. So that's replication. Many people use it for updating search indexes, like uh, search indexes, like Elasticsearch, OpenSearch. Um, of course, well, most databases are not that great at full text search. You would rather want to use a dedicated system for that. And of course, as your data changes in a database, you need to also update the search index. CDC would let you do it. Quite a few others, you could use it to propagate data between microservices, to move from monolith to microservices. So again, it's a huge topic by itself. Today, I would like to focus on those two use cases, updating caches and also maintaining denormalized views of your data. Let me mention a little bit of the, about the Debezium connectors, because the thing is, well, Debezium goes to the transaction log of your database um, and captures changes from there. The thing is, there is not one canonical interface which we just could implement once, and then we could use this for all kinds of databases. Unfortunately, there is a different, there's different ways for getting change events for, from each of those different databases, so different formats, different APIs, different file structures, and so on. The good thing is, Debezium does take care of that for you, so you don't have to care and our ambition is to provide you with a rather common, rather generic change event format. And I know people definitely value that because, I mean, you know, we always try to converge on a small set of technology and maybe have a single database, but that's not what's going to happen. Usually you will have MySQL and Oracle and Postgres and whatnot. So now having uh, one unified change event format coming from all those databases, this definitely, uh, you know, helps you a little bit with implementing, for instance, consumers or stream processing applications in a single way and you don't have to care ab about the particular source database. And coming back to the community aspect, so we have those what I would call core connectors, but then as part of the Debezium project on GitHub, there's also what we call community-led connectors. So in this case, is um, other organizations, for instance, like uh, Stripe, the payment provider, or InstaCluster, who maintain those connectors for, uh, let's say, Vitesse, which is a sharded database on top of MySQL, and Apache Cassandra. And even more interestingly, there is also external con uh, connectors based on Debezium. So um, essentially folks, for instance, like ScyllaDB, which is, uh, you know, alternative implementation of the Cassandra protocol based uh, in C++, they also wanted to have CDC for their ScyllaDB database. And they figured, well, instead of just implementing everything from scratch, we can reuse many parts of this Debezium connector framework. For instance, getting things like snapshotting, like getting an initial day state of your data kind of for free. They just need to implement a few SPIs um, for making this happen. Um, so it helps them to implement the CDC connector, so they will be much faster. And also, well, again, now you as a user, you will benefit from this because now also if you use Yugabyte or um, um, uh, ScyllaDB, again, you would have the same change event format as it is emitted from all the other Debezium connectors. So I would say it's kind of establishing itself as a de facto standard for CDC. I mentioned most of the times people use it with uh, use Debezium with Apache Kafka. There is uh, just briefly two other th uh, two other ways of using Debezium. So there is what's called the embedded engine, and this essentially means you can use Debezium without Kafka or any kinds of streaming platform, but rather as a library within your own application. And people use this uh, library-based mode oftentimes for kinds of ad adv advanced use cases. So for instance, or for integrating it into other technology. One example would be Apache Flink. So Apache Flink as a stream processing platform has CDC source connectors and they take the Debezium embedded engine to ingest data from a database straight into Flink without having to go through Kafka or any other streaming, streaming platform. So that's the embedded engine. And then there is what's we, what, we, what you can see here, what we call Debezium server. And Debezium server essentially is an alternative runtime for the Debezium connectors to Kafka Connect. Because what we realized is, well, people would like to use Debezium also with things other than Kafka, maybe Amazon Kinesis, Google Cloud PubSub, Apache Pulsar, Redis Streams, um, Pravega, Nuts, all those kinds of things. That's why there is Debezium server, which lets you use Debezium and stream those change events to all those um, streaming systems. All right, so that's Debezium. And well, again, I hope I could make the case this is a reasonable solution for getting, for reacting to changes in our database, capturing those change events, and well, in this case, use them to uh, update our caches. So at this point, this is how this architecture would look like. We would have still our application instances, our database, we would have now Debezium running with Kafka Connect, and we would stream those change events into Apache Kafka. Now, of course, there's one last part missing. We need to propagate those change events from Kafka into our caches. And this is what I would like to explain 
next. And actually, I will do this in a demo, or I, will sh I, 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 I also want to show you a demo. Before going there, I want to explain a little bit about this last missing part. So, um, you know, and you can see it here, it's this cache update application. And there's different ways how this could be implemented. For instance, there is a Kafka Connect sync connector for InfiniSpan. This means I could just deploy this connector into, Infini uh, sorry, into Kafka Connect, it would take the data from the Kafka topics and you know, write them into, cache, uh, into caches in InfiniSpan. So this would be one solution. I didn't do this one here because I wanted to add a bit a notion of stream processing to it. So I would like to, for instance, join multiple change event topics to materialize aggregates. And this is why I have a bespoke application which is using Kafka Streams as a stream processing API and which is based on Quarkus as a stack for building cloud-native microservices. So I believe there were plenty of Quarkus talks. I guess uh, you all have heard about it. So really to motivate it just a little bit here. Um, well, if you want to do a Kafka Streams application, in the simplest case, we just could uh, implement our own main method and our own main class and be done. This would work, but it would be a bit cumbersome because there's a bit of boilerplate you have there. Um, and now, in particular, if you think about how do I do uh, stuff like health checks or exposing metrics, um, you know, or maybe I would like to use this in a GraalVM native binary, all this kind of stuff. Um, well, using a stack like Quarkus helps you with it because there's an extension, a Kafka Streams extension for Quarkus, which just gives you all those things really for free. Um, so that's what I'm using here. And, well, one particular interesting way for using this is with GraalVM native binaries. Um, as you know, well, by doing ahead of time compilation, we get well, smaller binaries, that's not so interesting. We get faster startup, it's also not so interesting because, well, Kafka Streams, it's a long running process, right? So we don't care, does it start up in one second or two seconds, this doesn't matter. But what does matter is, by going uh, to a native binary, we also consume much less memory. And this is very interesting for this kind of stream processing application because we could have multiple instances maybe deployed to Kubernetes and just being able to pack multiple or many instances of such a Kafka Streams application on our cluster will be just very cost efficient. So that's Quarkus as the basis for this. Now let me go a little bit into the demo. And the first thing is I need to launch up a few things here. I have Docker Compose there, and I'm going to start this up. Um, and while this is starting, I'm going to run you through the Compose file, because there's quite a few things. Is this large enough? People in the back, can you read it? Yeah? OK, cool. So what do I have? I have uh, Zookeeper and Kafka just as my streaming platform. So this is you know, what propagates my events. I have my order DB, so that's our Postgres database instance as the system of record. I do have pgadmin as in UI, I don't really need it right now. I have Kafka Connect as the runtime for our Debezium connectors, or connector in this case. Then I have um, those instances of our order service. So I have this one in, well, NYC, it's all running on my laptop, you know, but that's the NYC instance. I do have the one running in London, and I have this cache update service. So that's this last microservice which I just mentioned, which runs Kafka Streams. And what else is there? Well, I have my InfiniSpan clusters. And I say clusters, um, it's one node clusters, right? But it's multiple of those. Again, the London one, the London one, and there's even a third one, a central one, you know, just to make it a bit more complex for the fun of it. Cool, so I hope this all is running. Now, well, the first thing I need to do is I need to register my um, connector for Debezium. And I'm, using to, I'm going to use this tool, KC Cuttle, for that. So just very briefly, for those who haven't been at my quickie talk yesterday, it's a command line client for Kafka Connect, which makes it just a bit simpler for working with Connect. So instead of using the REST API and having to memorize all those URLs, you can use this um, command line tool. It gives you tab completion and so on. So that's what I'm doing. And for instance, I can say KC Cuttle get um, plugins. And it will tr t tell me, OK, those connectors are available in this particular Kafka Connect instance, so all the Debezium connectors, for instance. Um, and I can register one. And let me do this. So I do KC Cuttle apply. By the way, it's uh, implemented following the semantics of Cube Cuttle. So if you are familiar with that, it will be familiar to you. And I say apply. And I send there the same JSON file I would usually just post to the Connect REST API. Now I, would, I should have my connector running, so I can do get uh, connectors, and indeed it's running, and I also can do kccuttle describe, and connector 
And also the tab completion, for instance, gives me the name, so I don't have to memorize the name. So I can describe this order connector, and it will tell me, okay, it's, it's running, it has a single connector task which is running, and it also shows me the configuration. So in this case, you know, what's the database, what are the credentials, well, the username anyways, and what's my include list. So in this case, I'm just interested in those two tables, could customize this if I would like to capture more tables, and so on. So that's my connector, should be running, and I can now actually place some purchase orders. And in this, or in this order service, this purchase order service, there's a very simple REST API, ChucksRS, super boring, I'm not going to show it to you, which just is there for receiving some purchase orders. So let me do this. And I'm a lazy person, so I'm just getting this from my history. What I'm doing is I just post this request there to place a purchase order. And it should tell me, okay, this has been placed, it has generated an ID, so that's good. There you go. And I can do another one, so this works. Now what I can do next is I can take a look into my Kafka topics which contain this data there. And by the way, in terms of the model, there is two tables involved. So there's one table, purchase orders, which are my order headers, and there's another table for the order lines. And now to you know, get the state of an entire purchase order, I would, like to, I would have to join those two tables together. It's a basic one-to-n uh, kind of relationship. In Debezium itself, you would usually get a topic in Kafka per table. So that's what, what we can take a look at. So le again, let me go to my uh, shell here and let me get the content first of all from this purchase order topic. So by the way, here I'm using this tool Kafka Cat or KCAT as it's called now uh, to examine the contents of this topic. And I see those change events. Now, the vital part of those Debezium change events is this before and after. Now this is as this just as an insert event. I just have this after part, the before part is null. Within those structures then, well, they resemble the structure of my table, right? So for each column, there is one, one field there, customer ID, order date, and so on. And then there's some metadata, like what's the version of the connector, what's the table, where this is coming from. For instance, in case of MySQL, we could tell you about the query, which was causing this change, position in the log file, all this kind of metadata, which could be interesting to you. So that's my purchase order headers, and I can place another one, and you will see quite quickly this shows up here also in, in the Kafka topic, so it's, it's quite snappy. Cool, let's take a look at the uh, order line topic. And before I do that, I would like to reconfigure my Postgres database a little bit, because what I would like to do is, I would like to be able to capture the old and the new state of a row in case of an update. And in, term, in case of Postgres, I need to configure it, I need to tell it, please you know, keep also the old state of rows in the transaction log. Um, otherwise, if I were not to do this configuration, I would just get the new state of, a, of an updated row. So let me do that. And I'm using pgcli for doing that. And I cannot remember that command, so I'm just a lazy person and I'm copying this. So I'm just changing the configuration of those two tables to say, yes, you should have the replica identity full, which means it will keep the old row state in case of updates. All right, now let me go to Kafka again. And now in this case, I'm examining this order lines topic, right? So before we were looking at the purchase order topic, now this is the topic which corresponds to order lines. There should be my previous inserts there. Um, so they are there. And now I, let me also do an update. And for updating, I actually want to cancel one of my um, order lines. So there's another API in this uh, call in this REST API, which lets me cancel specific order lines, which, ref which is represented here as an update. So now I would see, okay, my before state, it had the state entered for this particular order line, whereas in the new state, it, is, it has been canceled. All right, so that's you know, the raw change event data. Now, as I mentioned, I would like to have, in my cache, I would like to have a denormalized view. I would like to have one document or one structure, I could say, which resembles the entire purchase order. So I don't need to do a join when reading this data. For doing that, I use uh, Kafka streams. And first of all, let me just show you how this data looks like. So I can take a look at this orders with lines topic. So this is where this Kafka streams application you know, writes the, the joint results to. So let's take a look there. And you already see, well, that's the structure we are after. So this was my last updated um, purchase order with the canceled line. And again, let me just post one more. And we will also see, well, this, this shows up here. And now I have one structure which contains this entire purchase order and all its lines. And just for the sake of the example, to cancel one more, let me cancel, this is order number four, 
Let me cancel line number seven, and you will see that this join is recomputed, and now I have this state with the entered and the cancelled lines there. All right, so how does this actually work? How is this uh, joining logic happening? And uh, for that, I will just briefly show you how this Kafka Streams application looks like. So, by the way, who has been using Kafka Streams before? Oh, a handful of people. So for those who have not used it, it's an API for doing stream processing applications. So you can work on Kafka, uh, on, on data in Kafka topics, and you can do things like filtering, um, modifying, mapping data, um, grouping, aggregating, joining, all those kinds of stuff, like all those operators you would have there. And now in this case, it's a very simple um, thing. So what I essentially do is I get what's called a K table um, for each of those two topics. And a K table essentially just gives me a view to the current state of this topic for each key in the Kafka topic. So I have those two K tables for my order lines and for my orders. And next, I want to join them. So I use this join operator here. Oh, come on. And um, essentially, I'm joining on the order ID. So there is a very interesting, rather new feature in Kafka Streams, which lets me join on foreign keys in, in my topics. So you know now I have um, essentially joined those matching um, items for the same purchase order ID. Now, of course, I would like to have a single document, a single, as you have seen here, a single nested document for my entire purchase order. So not this classical relational representation. And for that, I'm just grouping my join result by the purchase order ID. And lastly, I need to aggregate it. So I need to essentially do some bookkeeping if some purchase or line, order line, for instance, gets updated or gets inserted for an existing order or gets removed, I need to recompute the state of this aggregate. And this is essentially what's, what's, what's happening here. So I have some sort of helper class which lets me track all that. And the last thing is I need to write this out to another topic. So this is what's happening here. And then I'm pretty much done. And now if you have been using Kafka Streams before, you will know, well, you would then have to run this pipeline and so on. Whereas here in this Quarkus application, you just have this CDI producer method where you return the topology. So it helps you a bit with that. You get all the configuration injected. So you could, for instance, change topic names later on, all this kind of stuff. And as I mentioned, you could get health checks. Um, so quite a few things in this Kafka Streams extension. All right, so this is how this is working. And now, uh, for the last part of the demo, um, well, I now actually could go to my application and get data back from there, right? So let me use uh, another API in the application, which is there. And this is very simple, localhost, 8080. So that's one of the instances, either the London or New York one. And now I can do this uh, sort of retrieval, and it will give me this structure which you know, looks like this one from the Kafka topics, but it's coming from the cache. And now you could ask, so hey, how do we actually know this is true? So how do we know this is actually served from the Infinite Span cache? How do we know it is not actually doing this join? And that's a fair question. And uh, to prove that I'm not cheating on you, um, let me show you just quickly the Infinite Span web console, where we essentially can take a look into the data, which is there. So I see all those orders which I placed. Um, so I, let me put another one. And if I now go to my cache and reload this view there, I have uh, five, and I could also take a look at them, so I have the full data there. But interestingly, as I mentioned, InfiniSpan is a queryable cache, so now I actually also can query data from this cache. So I can you know, answer more complex queries than just key lookups locally without having to go to the database. So let me just do this, and again, I cannot memorize it, so I'm just copying this query string. And this essentially just gives me all those purchase order lines, which, sorry, all those purchase orders which have at least one canceled order line. So let me do this. So right now there's two. Um, so they have canceled lines, that's good. And let me just, you know, cancel one more. So you see it actually works. So I will take this last one which I just created, cancel one. And now, if I go back to the view, run this query again, I see actually I have three purchase orders with, with cancelled lines. So I actually can run queries against this local cache. All right. So that's pretty much what I wanted to show in terms of the demo. Let me go back to my slides, and I would like to talk a little bit about some advanced um, aspects to that. So most importantly, all of this is working asynchronous. So Kafka by itself, by, very, by its very definition, is an asynchronous thing, which means 
um, if we write data to this Postgres database, until we see those changes in the local caches, there is eventual consistency in place. So essentially this means if we were to do changes or if we were to keep doing changes to the same item, to the same purchase order, well, we would always be at the risk of lagging a little bit behind if we query the data from our caches. If we eventually stop doing changes to one purchase order, well, then eventually we will see the latest state of this purchase order in the cache. Um, now, is this a problem or not? It depends a little bit on what you want to do and what your requirements and uh, desired semantics are. Um, I would say what quite common is a requirement is to do what's called read your own rights. So, if, for instance, you place a purchase order and now, uh, as a user, the next second you go to another view in this application which lists you all your purchase orders, you would really want to see your purchase order there, which you just placed. If it wouldn't show up there, it would be a bit weird. You would wonder, if did, go something, did something go wrong? Do you need to place it again? So that, that's not good. So we would like to have those read your own right semantics for some use cases. Maybe if we do some analytics use case where we just keep track of our revenue per category, well, then it doesn't matter, right? Um, if this purchase order which just came in a second ago, does this feed into this uh, analytic, analytics view? Doesn't matter, right? So it depends a bit on the situation. But sometimes you want to have read your own rights. And also, very importantly, well, we, what we would really like to prevent is any rights which are derived from stale states. So maybe we have this view from our data in the cache, somebody else comes and does a change, and now we take action, we write back based on the view which we created before. And this is a situation which we would like to prevent, and we can quite easily do that. So let's talk a little bit about read your own rights. So the idea there is, um, well, you have the existing system, so your order service has its REST API, it receives a purchase order, places the purchase order in its database. Now, as part of this same transaction, as part of the same right transaction, you also select the transaction ID. How you do it, this depends on the particular database. In case of InfinSpin, sorry, in case of Postgres, I should say, there's this function txid current, which will give you the ID of the current transaction. So we uh, retrieve the transaction ID and we just memorize it. Now, in the next step, uh, you would, of course, have uh, Debezium and CDC running, and there is one feature in Debezium which helps you with this, and this is, uh, it allows you to emit transaction markers. So essentially, you can have, in addition to your actual change event topics with the change events for purchase order, order lines, and so on, you can have another topic which has those transaction markers as you see them here. So there will be events which tell you this transaction 789, it started, and there will be another event which tells you this transaction 789, it committed, and by the way, as part of this transaction, there were, let's say, six events overall, and there were one, there was one event uh, for the purchase order table, and there was five events, maybe five inserted order lines. So it tells you um, about the fact that this transaction has committed and it tells you about those counts. And now you can use this information essentially to implement some sort of bookkeeping. So you could make sure that you receive all the change events for this particular transaction and you might buffer those events and um, you know you write them to the InfinSpan cache and then once you know, okay, I have seen my one purchase order event, and I've seen those five order line events, I have written them to the cache, um, so I know I have received everything from this, from this particular transaction, then you could go and insert another marker in, this, uh, in a separate cache, let's say, replicated transactions, where you would just say, okay, this transaction 789 has completely been propagated into this particular cache. And then in your actually application itself, um, now let's say we are in this scenario where we would like to take a, a view of, or where we would like to get a view for this uh, purchase order which we just placed. Well, um, we, we could then take this memorized transaction ID and look into this replicated transactions cache and um, see, hey, have we already received all the changes which originated from this last write which I just did? If we haven't, well then we could wait Maybe we could implement some sort of timeout and we could decide maybe either to show some stale data if that's fine or maybe go to the database if that's what we want to do. So we have some options there. And by the way, I don't even have to do this sort of explicit lookup. There's also a notification scheme in place. So actually, Infinity Span can give me a push notification if this 
cache has changed, so if this 789 marker event has been sent, I could get a notification, and then I would know, okay, now I'm sure I can go to the database, or to the cache, and read everything which was coming from my own last written transaction. So that's, in a nutshell, read your own writes. About uh, um, detecting stale uh, of writes which are derived from stale state. I mean, that's a pretty classic problem which we can solve using optimistic locking, which I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of you. So um, just for the sake of the example, let's say I have those um, two concurrent requests um, for the same um, purchase order. So one is going against the New York City instance, one is going against the London instance. So, so they both go to, the, to their own local cache, get their view of this data item, and what we have is we have a version counter. So this tells us what's the um, generation of this item, essentially. Now, if we do an update, so let's say the London instance does its update first, what we do is well, we change the actual data we want to change, so we set the quantity to four, um, but also this update is conditional. So it queries, this should only be updated if the current version in the database still is zero. So now for this first request, this is, to, is, this is true because it hasn't been updated. So the transaction of the London instance, this goes uh, through, and it also will increment the version counter to one as part of this transaction. So now in the database, the version counter is one and the quantity has been updated. Now this first process comes back and also wants to update his write based on his view of the data. And now it does the same thing. It has this conditional update checking on the version counter to be zero, but because the other transaction has already been committed, it is already one in the database, this update will essentially update zero rows. It will tell this to our application, and we could raise, for instance, an optimistic locking exception and signal to the client, please reload, for instance, the current data uh, from the database or from the cache to you know, have a current view of the data. So this is how we could prevent those writes based on stale state. All right, and then pretty much to wrap it up. So, well, coming back to our original mission, well, I, I hope I could make the case for this kind of architecture. So yes, we can have the system of record, this shared Postgres database, and still enjoy the uh, um, you know, speed of read accesses to local caches. We can benefit from just a closer network proximity. We can benefit from denormalization using Kafka streams in this case. And well, everything can be kept um, together, hold in, in sync via change data capture without you know, having us to do very much about it. Now, is this all worth it? Well, um, it, again, it depends, right? I'm not here to sell you anything. I mean, I would say there is a few pros about this. Yes, so we have lower latencies for our re read views, so that's, that's good. Um, I would also argue we can reduce the load on our primary database because, well, we, can, we will be able to serve many of those read requests from those caches instead of having to go to the database, which means we just can have more writes going there. We will, we will last longer with the single application, uh, sorry, with the single Postgres node, um, you know, without, before scaling it up, maybe before moving it to bigger hardware and so on. So um, this gives us, gives us some advantage there. And also I would argue it, it can help you to increase the availability of your entire system. So maybe you have this kind of architecture where you are fine to have some sort of read-only view uh, mode for your application. So uh, perhaps in case of updates, um, you're fine in the middle of the night to just serve some reads for a while because you would like to update your database. Well, this sort of architecture would let you do it because well, you could update your database in the background and you still would be able to at least serve reads and allow people to, for instance, examine their existing data in the database. So that's all good things. Um, well, um, of course, there's also some disadvantages, I guess, and obviously all this adds some complexity, right? So we need to reason about all the things. There's a few moving parts. We need to understand about eventual consistency. Um, you know, so I would like to make the case for this to be a tool in your box. Don't use it just blindly, but be aware of it that it is at your disposal. All right. I had this slide, uh, I was expecting I would be finished a bit earlier to mention a few things which are new in Debezium. I'm going to skip this. Um, you will I will share the slides later on so you can find this. There's quite a few stuff happening in Debezium. There will be Debezium 2.0. Um, so definitely check the, out the Debezium blog to stay in touch there. And 
What I want to show with you uh, or share with you is a few resources. So all those projects are on, on Twitter, of course, or on GitHub. It's all Apache licensed. If you want to check out this demo, um, you can find this also on the Debezium examples uh, repo on GitHub. So you can play a little bit with this or maybe use it as the inspiration for your own architecture. If you want to use KC Cuddle, it's on Brew, it's on SDK Men, all those kinds of uh, package managers. And it's also, of course, on, on GitHub. And with that, um, I'm pretty much done. Um, I, I guess we will just wrap it up. We can have questions um, outside in the hallway to make space for the next speaker. You also can hit me up on Twitter if you would like to discuss. Thank you so much for coming.